sun is out bright here in Rotunda, Florida, but that may be a little deceiving because the wind is very chilly sweeping across the central area of Florida. But we have come to the final moments of the Superstars competition with the biggest crowd that we have had at any of the competitive rounds. Every inch of viewing space taken around this whole region as we come to the final moments in our search for the Superstar. Hello, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson. We have 12 great athletes in the finale. And these 12 athletes have already earned $109,000. And today, in this two-hour special telecast on ABC, you'll see them scrapping for another $122,000. The eventual winner, of course, to leave quite a wealthy man. Two of our gentlemen who qualified for the final round are not here. Reggie Jackson, the American League most valuable player of the Oakland A's, involved in arbitration and settling his contract in the preseason. He was not able to get free in time to come here. Yvonne Cornway A of the Montreal Canadiens, the National Hockey League most valuable player of last year, injured, and he is not able to compete. So the fourth men and the point standings in their competitive rounds, the alternates have come in their stead. Stan Smith, the professional tennis, will be competing, and Brian Oldfield, the big shot putter from professional track, is also here. Also working with us today, a special treat for you, Howard Cosell will be joining us and visiting with the athletes as we see them in their final round of competition. And we have 10 games in which you can compete, 10 events. You're allowed to choose seven of them. You're not allowed to take part in your specialty. For example, Stan Smith cannot play tennis. Brian Oldfield will not be allowed to lift weights. And Pete Rose will not be allowed to participate in the baseball hitting. The idea being to play the other man's game. Now, points are distributed to the first five finishers. Points broken down on the basis of 10 points for first, seven for second, four for third, two for fourth, and one point for fifth. And every point scored by a man is worth $300 here in the final round. $300 per point. The bonus money is tremendous. The bonus money, $25,000 for first place, $15,000 for second place, and $10,000 for third place. So as I indicate to you these money totals, the man who emerges today as the superstar is going to go home quite a wealthy man. Our first action, the qualifying heats in the 100-yard dash. A total of seven athletes are running in the 100-yard dash. Brian Oldfield, with a cartilage problem and a knee, has pulled out of it. In the first qualifying heat, you have three of the fastest of the sprinters, O.J. Simpson, Bob Segrin, and Franco Harris. Now, the five fastest men in these two qualifying heats will run in the final. So with Oldfield out, one of the quick ones is gone. And you can see from the way the spectators are bundled up that it's quite brisk. Franco Harris will be running in lane number one, reluctant to take off his warm-up suit. O.J. Simpson has pulled off his top in lane number two. And running over in lane number three will be Bob Segrin, the pole vaulter. So we've got two running backs from the National Football League against the world record holder in the pole vault. And the wind is kind of whipping across the track. So I doubt that anybody's going to approximate O.J. Simpson's record in the 100-yard dash, which he set in a qualifying round of 10.18 seconds. They're ready to go now. Set. All three men get a good start, and O.J. jumps into the lead at about 20 yards, and he's coming on strong as Bob Segrin begins to move past Franco Harris, and at the finish, it is Segrin running in second place, and Franco Harris finishes third, but all three men are quick. Simpson winning 10.67 seconds, Segrin 10.81, and Harris 10.84. The third fastest man will go into the finals. Another look at the finish, as you see Segrin winning it by half stride over Franco Harris. In the second qualifying heat, 115 pounds. He holds 12 championships and seven world records. And of course, he became an international sports celebrity when he won three gold medals at the Winter Olympic Games in Sapporo, Japan. He became an obvious celebrity at home because everybody was saying Art Schink would have won four gold medals at Sapporo had he had a little more luck. This happened at 500 meters. He's so popular, they even named a tulip after him. Pete Rose from baseball will be in lane two. Basketball's John Havlicek in lane three. And Dick Anderson of the Miami Dolphins will be in lane number four. <laughs> third place finisher is the key man to watch here because Franco Harris finished third in that first qualifying heat. 10-8-4 and everybody gets a good start. Shake is out of the block very well for a big man. Closest to the camera it is Dick Anderson running very easily and Anderson taking the lead and Dick Anderson wins it easily. Art Shank finishes second, Pete Rose is third, John Havlicek pulled up. 
Pedro's time, 11.73 seconds. As we take another look at the finish, so your finalists will be Dick Anderson, Franco Harris, O.J. Simpson, Bob Segrin, and Ard Schenk in the 100-yard dash. We'll see that later. We'll be right back for the tennis competition after this message. Every place is occupied around the tennis courts. The weather is chilly and the wind is quite brisk. So the fellows with the tight controlled businessman's tennis game may very well be the ones that will fare the best. The luck of the draw has a very great meaning in how things eventually work out. And a lot of us thought that O.J. Simpson would be a prime contender for the tennis along with Kyle Rowe Jr. But the luck of the draw matched them in the opening round of the competition. And they provided us with quite a tennis match. Working into the wind, made the lob very difficult. Working with the wind, as Kyle Rowe Jr. is doing here, had to be very careful he didn't put too much on it. Otherwise, it would sail out. O.J. trying to slam, had trouble not only with the wind, but sometimes didn't get all of his racket on it. And O.J. actually had Kyle Rowe Jr. down four games to two and at 40 love, but he couldn't put him away. And then suddenly the momentum switched. Kyle Rowe Jr. got on top of his game, and O.J. started to make some costly mistakes. And then here came Kyle. Trying to lob, you see the wind hold it up. So they swapped advantage for some time, until Kyle won a game, and then suddenly, bang, he was on his way. And he went on to win the last four games and defeat O.J. Simpson six to four. Now watch this folly. Two outstanding athletes and two young men who have spent some time working on their tennis game as Rope comes to the net and makes a fine shot. At this point, O.J. started to shake his head, wondering how to handle him. Kyle Rhodes Sr. looking for a warm place to sit down to watch his brilliant son. Shot making. Kyle Rowe Jr. defeated O.J. Simpson six to four and shut out O.J. and our colleague Howard Cosell talked with him. First of all, Kyle, congratulations to you. And uh, I'd have to say the wind was an enormous factor in the play of both yourself and O.J. It sure was, Howard. You know, the first uh, five games, neither one of us held our serve, and I think a lot of it had to do with the wind. Uh, you switch sides, and you've got to start hitting lobs on one end and uh, trying to hit very easy on the other. You make me feel so old, to paraphrase the song. All the years of talking to your dad and now <laughs> you. And watching your dad as he watched you, I sensed that you sensed his presence. Well, I sure did. He's, he's always been a, a big factor in my life. And uh, while he certainly hasn't ever put any pressure on me, he's always uh, been there. And if I needed any assistance, he'd give it to me. Another match to remember had Pete Rose of baseball and the Cincinnati Reds going against Lanky Jim McMillan of the Buffalo Braves in basketball. And Pete Rose may be a little short on style, but he gets the ball back, and he is so long, so long on hustle. Pete Rose, nine consecutive seasons, has hit over 300, and you do that as a result of hustling. You gotta run out everything, and he runs out everything, and he hits a bag with authority. For example, in the National League playoffs against the New York Mets, he hammered into second base. Bud Harrelson, shortstop of the Mets, said something. And in the heat of the moment, they tangle, and both dugouts empty. But this is a trademark of Pete Rose. He leaves the ballpark after a moment like this without rancor. He just spins himself in his game, in his profession. He won the National League batting championship at 338, the third time he won it last year. He wins because he works. And here in this match against McMillan, who was one of the favorites to win the tennis, Pete Rose had carried the contest into the tiebreaker. But the first man to score five points in the tiebreaker wins the match. And it's now 2-1, Pete Rose, as we cover this contest. Jim McMillan played a lot of tennis during his days with the Los Angeles Lakers in Southern California, became very efficient at it. Pete Rose made mistakes like that. Scoring two points getting him in trouble. Time and time again, he had the opportunity to put McMillan away, but just couldn't quite do it. So it's 2-2 at this point of the match. Pete Rose came into the match against McMillan, having defeated Carl Schranz, and he had to go to a tiebreaker to beat Schranz, 7-6. and six. 
Rose. Great shot. is right on the line by Pete Rose. Not very much extension with the racket, but he is so strong in the forearms, he really doesn't need it. And with the wind gusting occasionally, the ground strokes were particularly troublesome. But McMillan ran him, and Rose kept running, and Rose kept returning it, and McMillan kept trying to put him away and had to get him in an extreme posture before he could knock the ball past him. Point guard. Three three in the tiebreaker between Rose and McMillan. Point. Jimmy had a little trouble with his serving, particularly the serving with the wind at his back. Playing the net here, Pete Rose hitting into the wind, unable to get a lob up over McMillan's head, and Jimmy just standing there at the net, peppering Pete until he'd get him out of position and knock the ball past him. So at 4-3, Jim McMillan needed this one point to win. His first serve into the net. And second serve out, so a double fault. And 4-4. Four, four. McMillan serves. Points are four all. If the McMillan will serve, Pete, you can choose which side McMillan's to serve to, either forehand or backhand. Whoever wins this point wins the match. You want this Pete side here? Choosing the forehand for the, four the serve. Okay. Good shot by Rose. Good retrieve by McMillan. Pete coming up. And the passing shot by Jim McMillan. Won it for Jimmy, 7-6. Rose having played 39 games of tennis in two matches. And right after the match, I talked with both men. Well, I had a, you know, I got the hustle key because I've only been playing tennis two and a half, three months. And, and Jim played great. I hit him five to two and I had a shot to put him away and I missed it and he come fighting back. And uh, that's why he's a tremendous basketball player because he never gave up. And, uh, I didn't give up. He just beat me, and he's a tremendous tennis player. I was just happy to, to reach the quarterfinals with him. Jimmy, congratulations. Good good win for you. Thank you, Keith. It was a tough win. I had to struggle. You know, now I know why they call him Mr. Charlie Hustle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have the tennis finals in the final round of the Superstars competition in a moment. Jim McMillan of the NBA Buffalo Braves, basketball player, against Kyle Rowe, Jr., the North American Soccer League in the tennis finals. They're even in games at 4-4. We pick up the action, McMillan serving and in trouble. He's down, love, 30. McMillan playing with the wind at his back and you have to be very delicate. Out. Get it up like that and it's out. And it's love, 40. Kyle Rowe Jr. trying to break service here against McMillan and take the lead. They're even at 4-4. Four four. Stan Smith, the defending champion of World Championship of Tennis, for the joiners for some comments. Stan, of course, not allowed to participate in tennis because this is his game. And these two balls put on quite a show as Roe tries to dump it, and then McMillan with a great retrieve, and Roe knocks it into the net. It's now 15-40. McMillan trying to hold service here. First place is worth 10 points. That's out. It's now 30-40. And every point scored by a man worth $300. So the winner of this match in tennis is going to walk off the court with $3,000 in his pocket. Net serve. So McMillan gets his first service again. Jimmy's had a lot of trouble with his serves today, particularly with the wind at his back. Good shot into the corner. Good retreat by Road again. Foul very quick. A deep shot. Road coming to the net. And it's good. Kyle Road Jr. wins it 5 4 as Kyle Road Sr. looks on. So Kyle Roach's game at this particular point appears to be the better of the two games as, as Kyle has assumed the lead here in the final. Stan Smith, what is it that Jim McMillan's got to do now to get himself back in this contest? Well, I think he's try to, gotta, try to get to the net quicker uh, and take advantage of his big height and reach. Uh, he's up there and he's tough to lob over and tough to pass. And so uh, Kyle's moving very well. He's very fleet of foot as a soccer player, I guess, has to be. Uh, so he's using that to his advantage. And Jim's had a little bad luck on a few of the points here, but they're having some very good points. All right, here we go with Kyle Rowe Jr. holding a five game to four lead in the tennis finals. Good shot. 
Miller having trouble holding service. It's Love 15. Franco Harris, Bob Sheegan, and O.J. Simpson were shut out in the tennis. No points. That's a very important thing to remember because O.J., as he indicated, had expected to get some points out of this, and Macmillan can't get it off his racket. So it's Love 30. Another one. So it is Love 40. So Kyle Rowe Jr. on the verge of winning the tennis unless Macmillan can really come back and he hammers it right into the net and Kyle Rowe Jr. has defeated Jim Macmillan to win the tennis. Rowe wins it, Macmillan second, followed by Pete Rose, John Havlicek, and Carl Schranz. And now here's Howard Cosell with our player. Now I want you to tell the folks what you said immediately after you congratulated Kyle Jr. on his victory. Now, come on. <laughs> well, I said, uh, you can tell what part of New York City he grew up in. Up there in Scarsdale, White Plains, or Maronek, where they play all the tennis. And uh, we don't play too much tennis in the ghetto. No, it's a far cry from Pennsylvania Avenue and Thomas Jefferson High School in Brooklyn. But you must be impressed by the brilliance of this young athlete. Well. I, I knew I was going to be in trouble as far as the tennis uh, went. When I came in Saturday night, I got in about 12 o'clock, and I saw him out here playing. So I knew I was going to be in trouble. <laughs> All right, let's turn to Kyle Jr., Jimmy. And once again, congratulations. You are just having a remarkable turn of it. And if you look at the camera, Kyle, this was a critical victory for you. Ten points had you lost, only seven points, and you'd have greater worries about O.J. in the ultimate and Segrin in the ultimate. Do you now feel that you uh, are in a secure position? You're never secure after one event, Howard, but uh, tennis and, 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 and golf as well, they're both events that I had to get some sort of points in to have a chance to win the thing, and uh, unless I, I really blow it now in, in the rest of the events, I should be uh, at least in the top six. Howard, thank you very much. Big win for Kyle Rowe, Jr. We have nine events yet to come. We'll be going for one of the finals at the swimming pool in a moment. All right, we move to the swimming pool now for our third final. We have six athletes entered in the swimming. It's 100 meters freestyle. You swim it any way you want. The golf has been completed. Dick Anderson of the Miami Dolphins won it. Kyle Rowe, Jr. took a second place. And we'll have the golf highlights for you a little later. In fact, right after we have the swimming final. Speaking of Kyle Rowe, Jr., somebody had better break his string of, of points accumulation because he's picked up a first and a second, a total 17. We're coming now to our third final in swimming, and this is an event in which he is projected as the favorite. So somebody better really come up with an effort, or he's liable to run off and hide early. But before we have the swimming final, let's join Howard Cosell and a couple of Dolphins. You see, I know he's going to win because I put analgesic bomb in Kyle Roach Jr.'s swimsuit. <laughs> so that halfway down the court, he's going to begin to be bothered by a serious problem. If that ever propeller's going to get him, he's going to fly a little bit faster. You were supposed to get out there and caddy for him in a golf stock, and it got cold, and you I uh, got momentarily up. held up by Howard Cosell. He stole my bottle of gin in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and that, of course, was an utter jest. It would have to be. But the truth of the matter is, as many of you might not know, uh, Larry Zonka, number 39, the most valuable player in the Super Bowl victory of the Dolphins, was invited to be in this competition. Look into that camera, Zonk, and tell them why you didn't have the guts to do it. Because I'm not an all-around athlete like some of these fellas. I'd rather just be good in one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Dick is funny like Howard, you know. <laughs> I thought you were going to go swimming there for a minute. Yeah. For a minute. Howard, Howard may yet go swimming this afternoon. As a matter of fact, if I don't get my bottle of gin back, Howard, you're going to be in that pool. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of motivation, I'm not so sure, but what a Howard might not be favored over Kyle Roach, Jr. <laughs> Kyle Rowe Jr., of course, the son of the man who became a legend as a football player at Southern Methodist University. He became a great all-pro performer in the National Football League with the New York Giants. And it's difficult for a young man to grow up and do his thing in athletics in the shadow of a famous father. But the Rotes apparently have handled it very well, because certainly Kyle Rowe Jr., wearing number eight here, is doing his thing very well. Many people think he'll become the finest soccer player ever, native-born American.
John Havlicek will be in lane number one as we go now into our swimming final. John Havlicek of the Boston Celtics, the basketball player, and he'll be swimming alongside the big shot footer, Brian Oldfield from the International Track Association. And Brian was here in the qualifying round. And he almost sunk. We'll see what happens today. Stan Smith, the great tennis player, is in lane number three. And Dick Anderson, the defensive safety of the Miami Dolphins, in lane number four. In lane number five, a man who figures to give Kyle Rowe Jr. some trouble in this event, Bob Segrin, and Kyle Rowe will be swimming outside in lane number six. So the three people I think you want to watch are going to be up at the top of your picture in lanes four, five, and six. But let's see if we can get Brian Oldfield cranked up and get Brian into the competition first. Now there, call to the starting position. What? Water comes up <laughs> at the edge of the pool, but Oldfield is in it. And early, you see Anderson, Segrin, and Kyle Rowe Jr. at the top of the screen there. All touching at about the same time. Off the flip turn now, Rope gets the lead. He picked up about a half a body length lead over Bob Segrin on that flip turn, and he is the only one using the flip turn. 100 meters, freestyle. You can swim it any way you want, backwards if it's necessary, and Brian Oldfield starting to labor a little bit right now. Another flip turn by Kyle Rowe Jr., and again, he picks up a little bit of distance on Bob Segrin. Interesting, too, I think, to note the respective styles, whereas Kyle Rowe Jr. is getting a lot of drive out of his legs. He's Arms are not quite as active as Bob Segrin. Bob having to work much harder with the upper portion of the body, but he is going to touch it about the same time as Kyle Rowe does. At, with 25 meters to go, they're almost even. But again, it is Kyle Rowe Jr. swimming very easily, getting a lot of drive out of the legs, and he immediately goes back into a half a body length lead over Bob Segrin. Ten points at stake here. Every point's worth 300 bucks, but most importantly, it's the points at this juncture of the competition, and at the touch, it is Kyle Rowe Jr. winning. A minute, 14 and a half seconds, Bob Segrin takes second place. Dick Anderson is going to come on to finish third, and Stan Smith will struggle in fourth. Ryan Oldfield has dropped off the pace and stopped, and John Havlicek will come on to finish fifth. This is where pain comes into it, as you can see from the expression of John Havlicek. So Kyle Rowe Jr. picks up another 10 points, and everybody trying to catch their breath. Here's Howard Cosell with the winner. Kyle Rowe Jr., the winner of the exciting swimming competition you've just seen, and Segrin really gave you a go for it, Kyle. Well, he sure did. You know, that last turn, I was so tired going into it that I decided not to flip it. And uh, he was strong throughout the race, Howard. I'm just glad to be through it and making it. You have had some day, young man, thus far. 27 points. You're in a commanding position in the whole competition, as you're well aware. Well, everything is just falling my way, I think. And uh, got another big day tomorrow. You know, when a young man like you enjoys this kind of success suddenly, nationally, the best young soccer player, certainly in North America with the Dallas Tornado, uh, one has to wonder about the whole of your life, being the son of a famous father, Kyle Rode, an extraordinary athlete. How much has that played in your life, thinking about it? Well, a very large role, Howard. I think my dad's attitude of, of wanting me to do what I really thought was best, and my thinking soccer was best, uh, helped a lot. And, and being around the whole sports world ever since I was, you know, 18 inches tall, it helped a lot, too, because you find out that the athletes are just as human as everybody else, and uh, you think you really want to emulate them, which I tried to do, and fortunately things have worked out. Well, Kyle Rowe Jr. wins another one. We'll have a look at the golf highlights in just a moment. In golf, Franco Harris learned the art of dropping a ball, and Brian Oldfield tried to use side saddle putting stroke, which didn't work too well, and Pete Rose proved able to bounce a golf ball across a lake, providing us with some memorable moments as we review the golf highlights. And Stan Smith oh, found the beach. Did you dig it when you play? Oh, yeah. Right down here. Do you want to hit this, kid? <laughs> Stan finished third with a 53. Didn't always finish that sand shot. As a result, wound up looking at that little rascal quite a bit. Franco Harris, well, he had the most unusual putter I think I've ever seen. 
Franco, you haven't gotten your money invested in that putter, have you? Huh? No, but I was trying to win some with it, but <laughs> that didn't work out either. <laughs> Franco also devoted hey, some time and the interest in the movie card game. Please, 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 come on. Hello. Franco had a 68. Then his sixth. That's for nine holes. John Havlicek. Well, John found some wool on the sporty rotunda course, too. He had a 64. Fifth. Had some strokes that almost worked, but not quite. Brian Oldfield had a 74, and uh, he was worried about being a marksman. Keep your eyes open, though, Bowie Cliff. I think you're going to make it, though. I'll get, them. I'll get those people over there. The marksman had uh, some of the spectators. Big crowd turned out for the golf. Does that count? On the green, Dick Anderson. Just as solid as everybody expected him to be. Dick shot a 40, which ties the superstar record for nine holes. And really can rip the ball. The cameraman, I think, at times couldn't believe that a man could knock the ball that far. Dick's a fine player, the final putt. They all count to see. They don't say how, how many, I guess. All right, Dick with a 40, standing at the ninth green, waiting for Kyle Rote Jr.'s scores to come in because Kyle was the man who definitely had a shot at him. Kyle hasn't played all that much golf, hasn't had that much time, but he is a very disciplined athlete, as we've already seen, and he hit some fine shots. On the seventh hole, Kyle Rowe Jr. hit this shot for plump. And he hit another one about the same oh, place. Oh, Kyle. Dumb, dumb, dumb. On the eighth hole, he had to knock this shot into the cup. For a birdie, almost, but not quite. So with two holes to play, he had to birdie the last two holes in order to tie Dick Anderson, which he did not. So it was Anderson, Rote, Smith, Rose, and Havlicek in that order, in the golf. Franco Harris, he'll be long remembered. Franco, I don't think golf is your game. The weightlifting started at 150 pounds, moving up in 20-pound increments, and there's every reason to believe this competition is going to go on for quite a while, and certainly every reason to believe that it's going to be very, very close. As we have seen such great moments as Carl Eller go to 280 pounds. Franco Harris didn't go out until he reached 260 pounds, and Franco is in the final round of competition. O.J. Simpson's in the final round. Bob Segrin's in the final round. We could be going very, very high. The first lifter, Pete Rose. And we are now at 190 pounds. Pete Rose, at 32 years of age, weighs right around 200, give or take a little. Of the wintertime suet, who has never done very much weight training, takes 190 pounds right on up. Next comes the speed skater from Holland, Ard Schenk. Oh, All right, 190 pounds. No, can't get it up. So Ard Schenk getting very little drive out of his legs, just simply couldn't arm handle 190 pounds. Now here is Bob Segrin. Bob, at age 27, has done quite a bit of weight training. Of course, he's had to in order to stay strong enough to clear 18 feet in the pole vault. But he's very seldom worked over 200 pounds in weights. Bob has got it up. Bob Segrin handles 190 pounds all right. We've lost one man so far. There's a lot of blood rush under my head when I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes Carl Schranz. Here. Brian Oldfield. <laughs> Brian Oldfield passing along some tips as we look at Carl Schranz, and Carl can't handle it. 
So at 190 pounds, we lose the speed skater from Holland, and we lose the skier from Austria. Carl, I thought surely you'd go on up to 220. No, I didn't uh, practice that hard. <laughs> and, uh, 190 is uh, too much for me. So, uh, you you're, you're the man that runs up and down mountains with weights on his back. Yeah, but not this much. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, Dick. All right, here's O.J. Simpson now at Hold it. 190 pounds. No problem for Juice. He just pops it right up. Yeah, you'll notice most of the fellows are using that wide belt as a support for the back. Here is Jim McMillan now, the Buffalo Braves, 25-year-old Jim. Okay, hit him hard, Jack. Hold it! Whoa, -ho! hang on, yeah. Well, he's got it all right. The referee calls it good. So Jim McMillan stays in at 190. Remember, the American Sportsman follows our Superstars competition. You go fishing with Jonathan Winters, and then comes ABC's Wide World of Sports. National Championship short track motorcycle race today, as well as the World Four-Man Bobsled Championship. Here's Franco Harris. No problem for Big Franco. So we lose two men at 190 pounds. Guard Schenk and Carl Schramm. Now we go to 200. You notice that Pete Rose buckles that belt on first thing. 200 pounds. Hold it. Hold it. Close. The MVP out of the National League. Uh, call him Charlie Hustle from Cincy. There's 200. Next, Bob Secret. Bob's going to be a daddy in a few months. He'll be the first for he and his pretty bright cam. Grab it up hard now. Use your legs. Hold it! Oh. He almost lost it. But Bob Secret stays in the weightlifting at 200 pounds. Bad. Oh, all right, O.J. Simpson walking in at 200, and this time O.J.'s gone to the belt. Whoa! Well, I'm a little surprised. I thought he would uh, handle 200 all right, because he's been walking around here for a couple of days talking about 230, 240. <laughs> I wasn't worried. <laughs> uh, you weren't worried. No, you weren't. All right, here's Jim McMillan. Jim can handle 200. No, no. No leg drive, and he had no momentum going for it. Just couldn't get it out. Hey, Jimmy. Get that coat on. <laughs> Turn around here. Well... Yeah, that basketball coming out of the corner doesn't quite put you in the proper. <laughs> no, no, I felt that if I'd have gotten that 200 pounds up tomorrow night, that jump shot would have been a little short. <laughs> All right, Jim. Here's Franco Harris now at 200 pounds. Oh, he just pops it up like nothing to it. So Big Franco stays in it. We have lost now three men as we pass through 200. We go now to 210 pounds, and it's Pete Rose's turn. Superstar from Cincinnati has never done much weight training. He's strong. No! He got no momentum. He had no drive out of his legs, and so Pete Rose is the fourth man to go out. He leaves at 210 pounds. Big shot for to Brian Oldfield, who is not allowed in the weightlifting holding court here with some free advice. You'd be better off to try to split the ball. And he's offered some helpful hints so far. Cam Sigrin, her husband Bob, next to lift. Bob Sigrin, gold medal winner in the pole vault, Mexico City, 1968. Here, Eugene, Oregon, 1972, the Olympic trials. A new world record in the pole vault at 18 feet 5 and 3 quarter inches. And then on to Munich, Germany for the 1972 Summer Olympic Games, where Bob Segrin missed in this last effort and settled for second place at a silver medal.
Controversy over the fiberglass pole, forcing Bob Seekman to use an unfamiliar pole. Now here he is in the weightlifting and the superstars competition at 220 pounds. Get set. Hit it hard now. Hold it. Oh. Hold it. Hold it. Got to straighten out the right arm and he does. So, I'll tell you, he went right to the brink with it before he finally got the right arm straightened out and Cam Segrin suffering right along with him. So, three men are still in it. Segrin, O.J. Simpson, and here's O.J. at 220. Do your leg. Hold it. Yeah, oh, he just popped that one right up. He came right up on his toes with it. Good drive. So, O.J. stays in at 220, and Franco Harris is next. Yeah. <laughs> OJ cleared 220 in his qualifying round, went out at 230. So here's Franco, who lifted 250 in his qualifying round. Remember he lost. He finished third to Bill Toomey and Carl Eller. Eller winning at 280. So Franco has no trouble at all at 220. All right, we're at 230 pounds of the sequence now. Well, Bob had a terrible time getting 220 up. Hard to know whether or not he can get his technique and his timing all pulled together so he can handle 230. No, you're not. Get set. Be careful in this. You don't want to hyperventilate yourself. You take breathe too deeply too much. It'll cause you a problem. Make you dizzy. Move up. Nope. No way. He tried to take his stride forward, wound up. Almost in a split, so Bob Seekman goes out at 2.30. <laughs> there he gave you a case of the rubble. Jeez, I'm going to need a corset to wear the next tomorrow on <laughs> back. I'm like, good heavens. That's heavy. That's a lot of weight, Keith. Let me you try. handled it, though, haven't you? You handled it. No. I've, I took that last time in the qualifying round. I did 2.10. That was most I'd ever done. And, uh, I haven't been lifting that much. Uh, I had a little tendonitis in my shoulder, and it was kind of hurting my swim, so I thought I'd... Work a little more my swim, and uh, then, of course, I found out these guys were lifting this much. You know, wow. So, I, know, I did more than I ever done before, so I guess I'm happy. So, two men remain. Five of our seven athletes who started in the weightlifting back at 150 pounds are now retired. Here's O.J. Simpson. And O.J. has 230 pounds up. That's the highest that O.J. has ever lifted. 230. Looking good, man. Bob Jenkins, Bob has third place locked. OJ and Franco Harris now are going to fight it out for the 10 points to go with first place. All right, here's Franco at 2.30. Okay, get set, good. See OJ up there in the corner. Hold it. Hold it. Breathe it. Good Frank goes hard to breathe hard at 230 pounds. That's bothering Juice a little bit. We'll be back with more in a moment. Only two athletes remain in the weightlifting competition, a pair of running backs out of the National Football League, O.J. Simpson of the Buffalo Bills and Franco Harris of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and O.J. Simpson now ready to tackle 255 pounds. And he's got it! O.J. Simpson, I think, a little puzzled himself that he's able to lift 255 pounds. Deuce only weighs right around 200 right now. Incredible performance, and Brian Oldfield kind of looking him over. <laughs> no world can he lift that much weight. Oh, cool, better put your shades back on. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Gotta get you a sight. This may be my last hurrah. <laughs> <laughs> 255 pounds, I wouldn't be surprised. All right, now, here is Franco Harris. Franco Harris, leader of Franco's Italian Army in Pittsburgh, came to the Steelers from Penn State University in his rookie season. Became one of five men to gain more than 1,000 yards in his first year of NFL football. The second Steeler running back ever to break 1,000 yards on the ground. He scored 10 touchdowns, which is a Steeler record. And seven times he gained 100 or more yards in a game. 
Big halfback had trouble with a knee in 1973, but still finished with 698 yards, and he's just back from a tour of American military bases in the Far East. As a matter of fact, he flew directly from the Far East, here to Rotunda for the competition. All Get right, let's good. watch and see if the big half can handle 255. Whoa! That's the first good time that he has shown any sign of buckling at all. But he cleared 255 all right. Here's Brian over here. Brian, we're down to the two men now. And they're reaching very high, unexpectedly high weights, particularly in the case of O.J. Now, is he doing something in his technique that's enabled him to go beyond what he's ever done before? O.J. looks really strong in his technique, uh, his leg placement. He's trying to do a split. If he, pro if he would uh, be a little bit more heavy, be a more assured with his legs instead of that pity patting that he's doing, he'd probably handle as much as O'Hara's can, but I don't think he will today. All right, we're now 265 pounds. Every point pays $300. Remember that. The difference between first and second place, three points. First place worth 10, second place worth seven. O.J. going at 265. He can't do it. 265 pounds, and he couldn't get it up. 220 was the best you'd ever done, huh? Yeah, last time I was here. What have you been eating? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you <laughs> keep this regular up there, stuff. make a linebacker out of you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was funny. I was having trouble with my left shoulder, so I adjusted a little bit and had a little trouble with my right shoulder there trying to get it up. Yeah, I adjusted you're, a little too much. You're a horse. Yeah. <laughs> well, Franco's a tough man. Well, man. let's see if Franco can handle it. Yeah, I'm sure he can. All right, 265 pounds. Of course, Franco and O.J. both need as many up points hard. as they can get. Oh, Franco's up at 265. He's got it. Franco Harris wins the weightlifting. O.J. Simpson comes in second. Bob Seek in third. Pete Rose four. And Jim McMillan fifth. Franco O.J. sitting there said, he, if I've improved 45 pounds, I know that big guy can go up another five or so. Have you been doing much lifting since the qualifying? Uh, I think I've done practically nothing since, really? since the qualifying thing. <laughs> you know, just haven't had a chance, but it kind of surprised me. You know, I was hoping that it wouldn't have to go that high, but uh, it did. And you know, Chuck Noel's going to sit down here and watch you now, and he's going to think, hmm, <laughs> I could make a defensive end out of that big guy. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Nothing like that, you know. Well I, well, I hope I can do something good in the running tomorrow. I might, oh, yeah. <laughs> I might keep me right. where I'm at. You'll be all right. Congratulations. Hey, thank you, Keith. All right, we see the winning lift again, and the average points per event. Kyle Root Jr. still the leader, followed by Dick Anderson, Jim McMillan, Bob Segrin, and Franco Harris now moves up into fifth place. The final round of competition for the superstars with $122,000 in total prize money to be spread around. And we're going to take a break in the competition here in Rotunda. We're about 40 miles south of Sarasota on the west coast of Florida. And we're going to play a game called Simon Says right now. It's a test of reaction and concentration. It's the same game we all played as children. And it can be very tricky, especially when Lou Goldstein from the famous Grossinger's Resort is the conductor. All right, gentlemen, the game is on. Simon's to show this place. Simon's his hands down. You don't move, you're out. Simon's to show this place. There's no game unless you work with me. Let's start again. Hands down. You'd be out, Brian, and you'd be out, but it's all right. <laughs> Nobody saw you. Put your hands back, Brian. You Simon's is put your hands back. Simon's his hands down. Simon's is walking. Don't be scared. Come on, have it. Simon's is going. Simon's is left. Peace. Left is the other way, Carl. <laughs> right. Peace. Nobody saw you. Turn back. Simons is right, face. Simons is holding. Simons is in place. Simons is bend back one. Back is the other way, fellas. Back, 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 back. Back is the other way. Back, back, back. You know, it's hard to tell her. You forward or back. Simons is up two. Hands down. If you drop your hands, bring them up. Now you're out again. Do you understand? Simons is hands down. The game is now on. You make a mistake, you're out. What is your name? Simons is your name. Oh. Say love. Carl. Oh. You're out. Here we go. Here we go. That's it. Out. Oh. Take his place. You can go with him. You're out. Simon didn't tell you to take his place. Simon says Brian over here. Hold it. You're out. Yeah. Simon says over here, Jim. 
Hold it. Hi, Mrs. Hold it. Smile, Jim. Simon says, smile. Show your teeth. Simon says, show your teeth. Simon says, everybody forward stretch. Simon says, hands down. Simon, a little faster, push it. One. Simon says, forward stretch. One. Overhead, two. So long. So long. So long. Simon says, hands down. OJ, over here. Simon says, OJ, take a step back. That's back. <laughs> You want a chance? Yes. Go back where you were. Simon says, go back. What is your first initial? Simon says, your first initial. Oh. Say it louder. Simon says, over here. Hold it. <laughs> Simon says, all right. He stutters when he walks. Simon says, over here. Simon says, hold it. Simon says, over here. Kyle. Simon says, hit place. Simon says, hands down. Smile, Bob. Simon says, smile. Hands, place. Whoop. <laughs> And Bob has an itch. Look serious. Simon says, it's play. Then for one. One, two. So long, Bobby. Take his place. Simon says, take a step back. That's back. Have a nice trip. Simon says, over to the left. OJ, you're leaving in a second. You can put your hands down. Simon says, put your hands up. That's up. Simon says, over to the right. Simon says, hold it. Simon says, hold it. Simon says, hands down. Simon says, right hand is shoulder number one. Simon says, hands down. <laughs> You're the winner. You're the winner. That's the winner right over here. Thank you, congratulations. May I ask you this? Was it easy to win? Simon says, was it easy to win? You know, Franco, it's a pleasure. But I want you to know that all of you would have been out at Strictly Sense of Human. I'll show it to you. Put your hands on your hips. Simon says, put your hands on your shoulders. That's your shoulders? Wait, 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 wait. All right, put your hands down. Simon says, put your hands down. Simon says, take a deep breath in. Oh, well, we'll see how long you last. <laughs> Thank you very much, fellas. <laughs> Lou Goldstein from Grossinger. We'll get serious in just a moment with the 100-yard dash final. To the 100-yard dash final should be an exciting moment. But before we have that, let's show you some highlights of what happened at the bowling lanes. Bowling is the only competition held during the nighttime hours during our two-day tournament. Big Brian Oldfield still has velocity. Go a little bit harder, Brian. <laughs> I'm not sure the back wall could stand it. Brian Oldfield finished with a 163, grabbed second place, seven points, or $2,100, if you'd like to look at it that way. And actually, Brian had a lot of bad luck. He actually bowled a little better than 163, but he took second place. O.J. Simpson didn't have a whole lot of luck and didn't get a very high score, but he had the fanciest bowling ball in town and some luck and a few laughs. Hard Schenk finished fourth with a 156. Carl Schrantz fifth with a 155. Stan Smith, the tennis professional, had a fine 161 to get third place. It's worth four points and $1,200, but Kyle Roth Jr. was the man of the hour last night at the bowling lanes. He rolled a 214. 214 to win it all in bowling, and that is a new superstar record. So that's what happened in the bowling lanes, and Kyle Rowe Jr., excelling in the skill events, has jumped into a big points lead. Now we come to the finals in the 100-yard dash. This is a critical event for people like O.J. Simpson and Bob Segrin and Dick Anderson. Let's get some comments from Bob Segrin on the 100-yard final. Here's Howard Cosell with it. Rapid, Robert. How can you possibly run in weather like this? Howard, I don't know. It's, it's unbelievably cold, and running into that wind is, is unreal. It's going to... I think some of these bigger guys got an advantage. The wind's blowing me away. <laughs> well, as we come up to the finals in the 100 meter, Young Rote has been going so strongly. How do you view the situation? Uh, almost disastrous for me. <laughs> I think unless Rote completely falls on his face today, I really don't have a chance. But uh, uh, he's had, uh, I think, a lot of luck on his side. But obviously, he's a great athlete. And he's prepared to, you know, he's prepared himself well for this contest. In what way uh, has he had luck on this side? Well. I 
214. I understand you picked up some shots last night in bowling. Now we're unreal. So, nobody uh, expected that. <laughs> Absolutely nobody. Start in lane number one, Dick Anderson. Lane number two will be Franco Harris. Lane number three, you'll find O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson, literally becoming a legend in his own time. The first man in the history of professional football to run for more than 2,000 yards. He gained 2,003 yards for the Buffalo Bills last season. A two-time All-American and Heisman Trophy winner at the University of Southern California. But he's busy in many other areas. In addition to working with us at ABC Sports, he is now making a motion picture. His co-stars are Lee Marvin, Richard Burton, and Cameron Mitchell. The picture called The Klansman, being shot in Northern California and directed by one of the great veterans in Hollywood, Terence Young. Bob Siegman will be running in lane number four, and Art Schenk will be in lane number five. This will be a very quick field, even though it is quite chilly and running into a wind. O.J. needs all the points he can get. Go to Bob Siegman, go to Dick Anderson. And O.J. gets the lead off the first 15 yards, coming out of the block very well. Dick Anderson running in second place, Franco Harris third. Here comes Bob Segrin now, Segrin moving past Harris, past Anderson at the tape. It is Segrin in second place. O.J. is the winner. <laughs> Got one, huh? Yeah, finally. <laughs> it's cold, believe me. Boy, it's going to be a little dangerous if I pull in something. Oh, no, I got good and loose, but it's cold. I'm used to this cold weather up in Buffalo, you know. Oh, sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the winning time for O.J. Simpson, 10.47 seconds, and watch in slow motion Bob Segrin with a great effort to get second place just at the tape. Segrin, 10.82 his time. Dick Anderson taking third in 10.98, followed by Franco Harris and Art Schenk trailing the field. So watch this effort by Bob Segrin as they come to the last 10 yards. Just about even with Dick Anderson here now, and Segrin reaching, giving everything he's got, and he just nips Anderson at the tape. So, the average points per event now. O.J. Simpson shows up in fourth place. Kyle Rhodes continues the leader. Dick Anderson averaging six points per event, followed by Bob Segrin, O.J. Simpson, and Stan Smith is now in fifth place. We come to the half mile, and based on their athletic history and past performances in the qualifying rounds of the superstars, Bob Segrin. Dick Anderson and Ard Schenk are three men that have to be considered, I guess, co-favorites. O.J. Simpson, of course, has to be a factor. But the one thing that all of these people have to keep in mind if they are to stay in the hunt for the title superstar, they've got to shut out Kyle Rowe Jr. because of the vast number of points he's been able to accumulate in the skill events. So the half-mile run could be one of the most exciting events of all, the competition here in the final round of the superstars. And now we understand that O.J. Simpson is not going to compete. Here's Howard Cosell with that story. Well, I'll tell you, three guys apparently had a shot at Kyle Rowe Jr. Of course, Segrin was one, Dick Anderson was two, and the juice was three, and now with the 880 about to be run juice, you scratch yourself. How come? Well, first of all, Howard, uh, I had to weight of possibilities. I figured the worst thing that could happen to me in an 880 is I could die. <laughs> I'm not in the, in the shape I should be in, and uh, I figured I wouldn't do too well in the 880, so I would drop out of the 880 and devote my uh, attentions to the baseball and to the obstacle course where I think I have a pretty good shot at winning them. So I figured that if I dropped out of this and saved myself for that, maybe I'll have a shot at uh, Segrin and Anderson. I, I, uh, I figure in the 880 to be between Segrin and uh, Dick and uh, and call Shantz, and I hope Shantz win it, <laughs> and those guys finish behind him, and if one of those guys win it, I think my strategy may have gone a rail. So actually what has happened, O.J. has taken himself down to only six competitive events, and Howard, you might be interested in knowing you're not the only one who's gone to the top coat, so is John Havlicek of the Boston Celtics, Hondo shielding his body from the cold wind. <laughs> John Havlicek, who is the all-time scoring leader for the Boston Celtics, wears number 17, and that's almost certainly a jersey that'll be retired when John Havlicek finishes his career with the Celtics, one of the most brilliant basketball players that I've ever had the pleasure of watching. 
And joining John Havlicek in the half-mile run here will be Dick Anderson as they get off for the start. Jim McMillan, Kyle Rowe Jr., Ard Schenk, Carl Schron, Bob Segrin, and Stan Smith. Yeah, get the paper. Now, based on the performances we have seen in the qualifying rounds, you have to think that Ard Schenk is a prime contender here. We know that Bob Segrin has been doing some distance work to hone himself for the event. And the question is, we don't really know how good Kyle Rowe Jr. is going to be in this event. So everybody has to be concerned, as we noted, with shutting him out if they possibly can. Dick Anderson, with those powerful legs of his striding into the front. And uh, Ard Schenk facing along behind him. So there are the three guys right there leading the pack who are the really the co-favorites for this event. The record is 2-12, set by Dick Anderson in his qualifying round. But I would certainly expect that record to fall today, despite the fact the fellas, as they turn around the bend here and head down the home straight are going to be running right into a very brisk wind on this unseasonably chilly day in Florida. Kyle Rote at the moment is trailing the field. Now he picked up a total of 37 points in a skill event. That is the golf and the bowling and the tennis and the swimming. He's yet to be shut out in the events that he has been part of. You get to see him in the baseball hitting, of course, where he also figures to be very strong. But right now, he is trailing the field in the half-mile run. This is a quarter-mile track, and now Bob Segrin moves up alongside Dick Anderson as they run along the back straight, and Segrin beginning to sprint, and he may be having to commit himself a little sooner than he wanted to. Now the question, does Anderson have enough to fight back? Does Ard Schenk have something left? And Segrin now starting to kick. Going into the turn, Anderson tying up some. He's not going to be able to run at him, and neither is Ard Shank. So Shank has nothing left, and it's Bob Segrin beginning to stretch it out. So the world record holder in the pole vault, defending champion in the superstar competition, looks a sure bet to win the half mile. So Bob Segrin is leading Dick Anderson in second place. Segrin crosses the line at 2.11.53. That is a new record, Dick Anderson second. Carl, Carl Strong is third, Art Schenk finishes fourth, and Jim McMillan five, with Kyle Rowe Jr. running last. Got your breath? You had to put it on a little, put that sprint on a little early, I think, and you wanted, didn't you? Yeah, I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> I uh, was worried about Shank and Anderson. I didn't know what, you know, they looked so strong. The 220 gone, I thought I'd better open it out and tire them out. Uh, tire myself out. You want a piece of good news? Of course, uh, Kyle Rhodes got no points. That's good news. <laughs> Although, I, you know, for me anyway. Well, Bob, you still have a shot at right around 40 points, 38 to 40, so you're very much in the hunt. If I can win the obstacle course and, and beat Kyle and be by a lot in the baseball, I have a chance, yeah. But it's going to be close. Depends on what Kyle does in the bike race. Good luck. That's going to be the key. Now, looking at the points per event average. Kyle Rowe Jr. went into this half mile with better than nine point average. But getting shut out, that average suddenly drops down to 7.4. And of course, Dick Anderson and Bob Segrin and O.J. Simpson very much concerned with the money for second and third place. First place, a $25,000 bonus. Second place, a $15,000 bonus. And a $10,000 bonus for third place. We'll see what happens in the finals of the bike race in just a moment. The finalists for the bike race determined in qualifying heat. The big Dutchman, Ard Schenk, won his qualification run in a most convincing manner. Kyle Rote Jr. won his qualification heat, and he was the fastest of the qualifiers. So it's going to be particularly hard to shut him out. As a matter of fact, if Kyle Rote Jr. wins this event, they can start fitting that superstar medal for him right now. In second place, it'll help, too. All right, now, a man who's going to be standing among the crowd watching this bike race most attentively is Bob Siegman, because Bob Siegman still has a chance if Kyle Kyle Rote Jr. should finish second or worse. Then Bob Siegman's going to get pretty excited about it. Stan Smith pulling off his fur coat now, getting ready to run. He will be in lane number two. In lane number three will be Jim McMillan. In lane number four, big guy that everybody's really scared of, Ard Schenk. Powerful man. And over in lane number five, another fellow with great leg power, Dick Anderson. So they'll be held upright, and they will come away. These fellows behind him are holding the bike so that everybody gets an even, equal start. Kyle Rowe Jr. running in first place inside. Art Schenk is right behind him. Everybody running very tightly packed here. 
and you really do have to be careful working your way through these turns. And you'd be surprised how fast they're going sometimes, or how difficult it is once you get your momentum swinging to the outside, how hard it is to bring the bikes back. Now, the bicycles are prepared as equally as possible. Nobody gets a chance to work on them. They are just simply set there. You climb on it, and you go racing. It's one speed. Four times around. Uh, Guard Schenk is sitting right where he wants to be because he, in this particular position, has Kyle Rowe Jr. helping buffer the wind, which is quite strong. Jim McMillan is down, coming out of the turn. It looked like McMillan caught the front wheel of his bicycle on the rear wheel of Dick Anderson, and Anderson now is off his bike. All of the spokes are ripped out of the rear wheel, and that's apparently what happened as they tangle coming out of the turn, and what a break this is for Kyle Rowe Jr. Because he's sitting up there in front right now, and even if he should finish in second place, he's going to be in a very commanding position. The question everybody's concerned with, though, is Jim McMillan all right? And apparently he is as he stands up. But both he and Dick Anderson are thoroughly disappointed with this sudden accident that happened coming out of the turn. It looked like they locked wheels, and believe it or not, that is the first accident we have had now. And this is our fifth competition in bicycle racing. So here we go into the bell lap now, the final lap. Stan Smith is going to profit from the accident as well because he's up in third place. Question is, can Kyle Rowe Jr. hold off the charge of Art Schink? And you know the big Dutchman is going to get after him coming up that back straight. Both men now reaching down the pain barrier, trying to get all they can get, and here goes Schenk. So Art Schenk on the back straight starts just blasting away from Kyle Rowe Jr. But Kyle is going to be in Fat City with a second place finish as Art Schenk comes on to win. Ten points. Kyle Rowe Jr. takes second place. Seven points. Stan Smith will finish in third place. And we'll have to wait for a decision on Dick Anderson and Jim McMillan. So Kyle Rhodes Jr. gets seven big points in finishing second place. And let's go back in slow motion now and study the action as to what happened. You see Dick Anderson there in the blue. Jim McMillan now at this point trying to hold himself away, trying to get the bicycle back inside. He just could not do it, had too much momentum. Perhaps the wind blew him. But Jimmy hooked the front wheel on Anderson's back wheel, and he went down in a tumble. But he is all right. Now here's Howard Cosell. Number 40, what happened from your point of view? Tell us. Well, Howard, you finally got some controversy to go in this <laughs> superstar. No, I was uh, sitting right behind Kyle Rotenart Shank in uh, third place and coming out of the turn on the, the back turn on the second lap. Um, McMillan started to come up behind me and looked like the brackets in his front wheels uh, just caught my back spokes and ripped out about half my back spokes. My chain didn't come off, but with the spokes sticking out, they just, uh, you know, stopped me at the time. Well, it's a tremendous disappointment for you because uh, I'm sure you figured that you'd finish second or third. Well, Howard, I expected to get second or third. I was sitting behind the, the two first-place finishers as it was. I think Art Shank is, you know, definitely would have won it because he had a tremendous burst of speed at the end. But uh, I think I'd have been right in there with Kyle Rote, and uh, I just hope they let me, you know, run it for time, at least for a third-place time. Uh -huh. So, in effect, you're lodging a protest. In effect, I'm lodging a protest, Howard. A uh, fish... Jimmy, you all right? Oh, yeah, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was a tough break there on that last turn when we came in. Uh, I think it was that, you know, everybody was, like, jockeying for position, and uh, especially with the wind playing a big factor there. As we came off the turn, a lot of guys were more experienced in the bike racing, was staying on the outside, letting the inside guys block this breeze coming in. And so I was sort of the inside. As we came on the uh, stretch there, as uh, Dick's bike was in you know, like third lane, I was in second lane, it just like collided there, and my front tire got caught up in his uh, back tire, and that was it. Well, we're going to get that decision, and we're just glad you're all right. Oh, yeah, so am I, I so am I. For that decision on what they're going to do, the judgment, let's go to Howard Cosell. Well, we're, of course, with Barry Frank, the meet director, and Barry, the decision has just been made as to Dick Anderson's protest. What is it? That's right, Howard. We decided that since there was no purposeful interference by McMillan, he was merely uh, trying to pass, that it's racing luck, it's most unfortunate racing luck. Of course, the best thing is that no one was injured. But uh, Stan Smith, in finishing third, uh, did not believe that he had to ride against anyone else and that his time would stand. Consequently, what we'll do is award them the positions that uh, each would have had had the race ceased then. Uh, meaning that Anderson will finish fourth, will be awarded fourth place, and McMillan will be awarded fifth place. 
All right, there are the official results of the bike race, and Art Schink, in winning, has kept the fight for first place alive. Kyle Rowe Jr. has only one event to go. He's in the baseball hitting, but he is not in the obstacle course. Bob Seguin and Dick Anderson are in both events. Either man can score a first and second or 17 points, and they can beat Kyle Rowe Jr. So, the fight is still on, and we'll continue it in just a moment. The obstacle course, the must event for Bob Seguin and Dick Anderson the prime pursuers of Kyle Rowe Jr. as we look for our superstar. They must involve themselves in the runoff where 10 points for first and seven points for second awaits them. The obstacle course as we look at this demonstration run reflecting back to a great moment given us by Pete Rose here on the left and Reggie Jackson. You go up over a 12 foot wall, come off that wall, make your way through these concrete tunnels. You have to be careful so that you don't lose your momentum coming off that 12 foot wall. Hit the blocking sled and then work your way through this series of tires. If you miss a tire, you can be penalized five seconds. Then you've got to build up momentum and speed to clear a 12-foot water jump. You hit the water, a foul, you lose five seconds penalty. Clear the high bar, set at four and a half feet, knock it down like Pete did there. That cost you five seconds, and then two hurdles to the finish. So now here we have Ard Schenk who will be attacking that 12-foot wall alongside of Pete Rose. Now, though they are running alongside of each other, they are running against the clock because the two fastest men will go into the runoff for first place. And the two people who have the pressure right square on their neck, Bob Segrin and Dick Anderson, who are chasing Kyle Rhodes. But let's see what happens here with the big Dutch speed skater and the National League's most valuable player, Pete Rose. They hit the top of the wall about together, but Pete's off first. Running against the clock. Despite the fact they're running alongside of each other, they are running against the clock. Both of them get through the tires all right. No penalty flags up. Pete Rose clears the water. He's over the high bar. Okay, Pete Rose bearing down on the hurdles for the finish line, and it's a good run by Pete. 27.35 seconds and no penalty. Arch Schenck. 28.48 seconds, so both men are under 30 seconds by a considerable margin. So Art Schenck, 28.48, Pete Rose, 27.35. Now, O.J. Simpson, who has to be one of the considered favorites here, and Carl Schrann. This great Austrian athlete became a cause celeb in the 1972 Winter Olympic Games in Sapporo, Japan. The charges of professionalism caused him to be barred from the Winter Games. And in 1968, he was denied a gold medal in the slalom when officials ruled that he had missed a game. So Carl Schranz, for a decade and a half, one of the great skiers in all the world, never got the gold medal he sought. And he has concluded his brilliant competitive ski career. Tony Mark. Carl Franz in the white shirt running alongside of O.J. Simpson. Remember now, they are running against the clock. Time is so important. The two fastest men will go into the runoff. We're 10 points for first and seven points for second. And O.J. is in good shape. He's got a good one going. Now here we get into the penalty situation. Got to clear those tires. He does it just fine. Now comes the 12-foot water jump. O.J.'s got a good one going over the high bar. Big leap. Here comes the final two hurdles. O.J. Simpson's going to have a very fast time. Carl Franz having some trouble with a high bar. O.J. snaps the tape. 25.36 seconds. That's the fastest time so far. Carl Franz in with a five-second penalty. Total of 36.25 seconds. So O.J. Simpson now with a 25.36 second performance over the obstacle course has added to the pressure for Dick Anderson and Bob Sigrin. Dick right here, well, Actually, as far as time to beat, Pete Rose is now the second fastest. But Dick Anderson has to be most aware of the fact that Bob Segrin is yet to run. And Segrin holds the obstacle course record. Anderson running alongside of Stan Smith, another fella that you can't ignore because you make the slightest mistake and pick up a five-second penalty, and you're not going to be in that runoff. All right, let's see what happens. It's so important to hit that wall just right. You can't waste a whole lot of time hand climbing that rope. You've got to literally grab that rope and walk up that wall. So let's see what the big safety man of the Miami Dolphins. Oh, he hits the top of the wall in good order. He's got a good one going. Stan Smith struggling some over the wall. Meantime, Dick Anderson is on the blocking sled. Now comes the treachery of the tires. Too fast and you can blow it right there, but he handled it very well. He's over the water jump all right. He's over the high bar, and Dick Anderson's got a good one going. 
First hurdle, second hurdle, snap the tape, great run for Dick Anderson. 24.99 seconds, that's the fastest. And Stan Smith is across at 29.55 seconds. So now Dick Anderson is the fastest over the obstacle course. With O.J. Simpson, the second fastest. Both these men now have got to sit and wait for Bob Siegman and Larry Zucker has restored order in his domicile and he's come back here made peace with Howard to watch the obstacle course run Bob Segrin who holds the record at 24.07 seconds and Bob now knows that Dick Anderson has run it 24.99 and OJ Simpson 25.36 Franco Harris will be running up alongside uh, Bob Segrin and Franco Harris is another fellow to be reckoned with too we have seen him in practice handling very well more. well under 30 seconds Segrin's the man to watch, though. He's running against time. One, two, three, steps. Top of the wall. Good start for Segrin. The world record holder in the pole vault, and he's off to a very good start. He's in the tires, and he's clean. No penalty there. No trouble at the water. Over the high bar, Segrin's got a good one going. He should handle the hurdles all right. He does. He's at the tape. And listen to this. 23.20 seconds. A new record. And Franco, <laughs> Franco surrendered. He's going to finish in one piece. So, looking at the times, it'll be Bob Segrin against Dick Anderson. The two men who had to be there, they will be in the runoff. And O.J. Simpson will be dropped to third place. Pete Rose will finish in fourth place. And Ard Schenck will finish in fifth spot. Next up, we'll have the baseball hitting, and there will be the story of Kyle Roach, Jr. But Bob Segrin and Dick Anderson are in the runoff for the obstacle course. Baseball hitting in the obstacle course. Lead over Bob Segrin. Now, if Bob Segrin can defeat Kyle Roach, Jr. in the baseball hitting, which is Roach's last event, by six points, and then Siegrin win the obstacle course, an event in which Rote is not entered, then we could have a tie. If Bob Siegrin can defeat Kyle Rote Jr. by more than six points in the baseball hitting, and then win the obstacle course, then Bob Siegrin could once again be the superstar. Now here is the man, Kyle Rote Jr. Picked up only one point in his first six at-bats, and that's called an out, a ground ball, called an out. Kyle has only one point. Does not want to get shut out. That's going to be called it out. Got it up into the wind, didn't have enough on it. And it's out number two. One more now. At bat. That's in the wind. It will not carry to the fence. Kyle Rowe Jr. gets only one point. And so it's very obvious that he is not going to score in the baseball hitting. So Bob Segrin and Dick Anderson are still alive. Bob Segrin now at the plate. Bob Segrin failed to score in his first six at-bats. That's one. That's one point for Segrin. He needs a lot here, and it's all the points he can get. He needs a second place at least. That's one point. So now Segrin has only two. Dick Anderson is finished with seven. And right now, he sits in second place. Stan Smith has the lead with a total of 11 points. So the tennis player is about to deliver a crushing blow here to perhaps Bob Segrin. We'll see. Bob swings it. He's got it in the air. The wind going to help it. It is out at 250 feet. He gets two points. He has a total of four points. So Bob Segrin has only four points. Here's another man who could do some damage to Dick as well. John Havlicek who was a fine baseball player at Ohio State University. And the big Celtic has just popped one, lined it out at 250 feet for two points. Man, the pressure's on me, man. I gotta get up there. I give you 10%. 10%? I think it's a Franco Harris and Kyle Rose. Kyle, like, that'll be more than I'll be making. <laughs> All right, John Havlicek has an out. He's popped one up. This one is really what? That'll get out of here, and it's two points for two. John Havlicek. So John now has a total of six points in the baseball hitting. John doesn't figure in the overall point total, particularly as far as first, second, and third is concerned. But Franco Harris does. He comes into the last inning with six points. That's hit well to the right side, and it's out at 
300 feet. Three points for Franco Harris, nine points. And now Kyle Rhodes Jr. has it locked. He is the superstar. Here's Howard Cosell with Mary Lynn Rhodes. Well, the competition, of course, comes down to its final event, and it goes on. But my darling, your husband has already won everything, and it oh. must have been just a great, great day for you. Oh, well, the last few minutes of the baseball were kind of tough, because I thought Anderson could take it all, but it's really <laughs> neat. <laughs> well, Kyle Jr. told me when I congratulated him and spoke with him that you had a lot of things to do with the large amount of money Kyle has won. But he said, we don't plan to keep of all, all of it. We plan to give some of it away. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us a little more about that, Jim? Um, well, you know, we've really been blessed, and we've had a lot of privileges and things, and there are a lot of people that haven't had the things that we've had, and we'd like to share some of it now that we've got a lot of extra. As I look at your father-in-law, I have to think of all the years we've spent together, Kyle, and it must be an extraordinary moment for you. Oh, the daughter-in-law like this, a son like that, and people who do want to share. Well, as I told you, Howard, uh, in the past, I've never really been able to say what your greatest sports thrill is, and this really is watching his participation in this competition. I just couldn't be more pleased for him and Lynn. I think, as I said earlier, he is an absolutely perfect reflection of you, except a better athlete. Of course. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Thank you both. Congratulations to you both, of course. And with your uh, privileged approval, Kyle Jr., bless you. Thank you. So Stan Smith wins the baseball hitting, worth $3,000, but Kyle Rhodes Jr. is the superstar and claims the $25,000 bonus that goes with first place overall. Still to come, the obstacle course runoff and the fight for second place, which carries a $10,000 bonus, that fight between Bob Segrin and Dick Anderson. So Bob Segrin and Dick Anderson square off in the final moment of our competition. The runoff to determine the victor in the obstacle course. And the man that pops this ribbon first will realize a difference of $5,900. Second and third place in the overall standings at stake. A lot of bonus money, but the difference between second and third in this runoff, $5,900. Bob Segrin set a new record for the superstar competition on the obstacle course at 23.2 seconds in the first round. Dick Anderson had a fine run of 24.99. So here are two superb athletes ready to charge. Dick Anderson, defensive safety, and very much a part of the success of the successive Super Bowl champion Miami Dolphins. Number 40, the native Colorado and one of the most brilliant defensive players of the decade. And here he is, age 27, mature physically, emotionally, used to the pressure, and of course so is Bob Segrin. How many times has he stood on the pole vault run under enormous pressure? Here it's dollars and cents, and Bob Segrin is over the wall in a hurry. Off to a big start. He has a big lead. He's on the blocking sled already. He's in the tires as Anderson releases the blocking sled. Segrin's lead gets bigger and bigger. He's over. No penalty so far. Clears the high jump, and Bob Segrin is going to win the obstacle course. So Bob Segrin takes second place. Dick Anderson will finish third. Bobby? Ooh. Looks like you pulled something. Pulled a groin muscle on the last run. Oh, boy. I didn't know if I was going to be able to do the finals. <sighs> didn't help any. That gives you a total of 38 points. Gives you second place. The difference between second and third was $5,900. And a big difference between 44 points and 38 points. <laughs> the Superstar Medal, just presented by Mr. Joe Klein, president of Cavanaugh Communities Incorporated, is around the neck and on the burly shoulders of one Kyle Rote, Jr. Congratulations, young man. Well, thank you, Keith. I think this medal is, is very emblematic of, of the way this, this whole tournament's been run. Uh, Joe's done a great job down here with Kavanaugh, and I know I'm speaking for the rest of the athletes. We've had a great time and ma made a lot of new friends, and it's just been tremendous. Of course, medals are nice, but there are other things that help make life even nicer. Mr. Peter Ennis, who is the vice president of marketing for the Fram Automotive Division, has some of that joy right here in his hand. Thank you, Keith. Kyle, congratulations Thank on behalf you, of Fram. You win the trophy, 
and also this check for five thousand dollars to the u.s olympic Fund. it's really been great being with you and you've done a wonderful job well thank you it's uh, a great honor to be able to give it for such a worthy cause that's tax deductible well i hope so <laughs> Total winnings for the 12 finalists, Brian Oldfield, $5,000. Pete Rose will go home with $8,200. Jim McMillan wins $8,700. Stan Smith, $9,800. John Havlicek, $10,000 even. Carl Schranz, $10,050. Franco Harris, $11,900. Ard Schenk will take $20,350 back to Holland. O.J. Simpson winning $21,900. Dick Anderson, $30,300. Bob Segrin, $41,550. And Kyle Rowe Jr., $53,400. And so we come to the end of the superstars. Five rounds of competition. The young man who won it, Kyle Rote Jr., accumulated his points out of the skill, Evans Howard. You made a point of that during the course of the competition, of course, Keith, and you are absolutely right. He's a remarkable young man with remarkable parents, and he so exemplifies them in every way that it makes you feel good to see a young man like this become the superstar of them all. And I must say, very briefly, having been given the opportunity to join you for the finals, what a marvelous series I think it's been. What great interest and enthusiasm it's engendered around the country. And I think it's going to become a very, very important show for the years to come on ABC Sports. And we're all very proud of your performance as always. This Thank has you, been Eric. your series. I think, too, that one of the things that I keep hearing across the country is that suddenly people are able to see men that they've watched as warriors, in a sense, in so many competitive events. But suddenly, here they are warm friendly humorous human being in a strange way and only for those of us who have been in the olympic village at the various olympiads of the recent decade uh, the feeling here is almost like the feeling there the byplay the interrelationship between the athletes the way bob segrin so great a one himself a past gold medal winner went over after the initial disappointment of failure in the baseball competition and said to kyle roach jr Kyle, you're a brilliant young athlete, and I congratulate you. And you get a sense of where it's at when you're with young people like these. It's been a marvelous experience.